It's so good to see you guys here because uh, just a year ago or so, this was the science meeting, the entire science meeting. And you can see the audience has grown and so has the science team and so forth. Uh, you'll recognize a few faces there. Not all of them were involved in the science, but this is, this is when we started looking a little more coherently at what we were doing. Uh, before that, it was really gung-ho exploration led by Steve and Chris and people like that. And uh, at the, towards the end of the first two years, Steve really really realized that we needed to focus down and, and look at what we are doing. We can't do everything and to, uh, to take a grip on our science. And that's what I'm going to try and do, just fill in the gaps. My images are not nearly as inspiring. And some of them, uh, he moves so fast he needs satellite tracking to keep up with him, uh, are not uh, fully up to date in terms of some of the depictions. But uh, nonetheless, it's, it will give you an idea. But I want to start with, with these two quotations from Jackie King's paper. Uh, the first is that the Okavango system is a vital part of the southern African mosaic of wetlands that supports both resident and migrant birds and other wildlife and would need to maintain its ecological status to ensure their long-term viability. So if we're going to start talking anything around uh, protected areas or conservation or anything like that, you've got to realize that you can't isolate little pieces of this puzzle. You've really got to take it as a whole. And the buffering effect of the Quito River, the buffering effect of the Quito River, was shown to be vitally important to the lower part of the system. Its large floodplains store significant volumes of water that are released slowly in the dry season, maintaining the delta. And this is an important realization because this is a water tower that will sustain the life in the face of development. And that's what we're facing scientifically is how do you sustain this magnificent system in the face of the inevitable, whether we like it or not, it's going to happen, development of the system. So basically the philosophy we follow in from the scientific perspective goes to if we're going to conserve this, Oh, I have got a pointer. Yes. If we are going to conserve the Delta as was the initial inspiration and is where all that tourist uh, and public exposure of the magnificent Delta and wildlife uh, exists, then we've got to do this. In other words, we've got to look at the whole system. Exactly what Steve has outlined, exactly that it's not just a Delta issue. It's, it's a complete system issue that we're talking about. And, and as Steve rightfully points out, when we go to that system, when we go to our study area, and we look at the available data, how do you conserve something where you don't even know what's in that? That's the philosophy. You've got to have some indication of it. And so where the primary goal is to establish scientific baselines for conserving proposals in a, what we can regard as a wilderness as a, as a big blank area in Africa. This is all GS, GISP uh, records. Steve showed you the plants, but that's the entire record for Southern Africa, and there's still a massive gap, no matter how you look at it from a scientific perspective. So the core study area is a very interesting one. In a broader context, we look at Southern Africa. It's right in the interior plateau. It's a fairly high altitude, uh, and it's on these incredible uh, Kalahari sands, as we put there. There are two primary, primary uh, ecosystems that we're considering in the core study area, the Miombo forests and the grass and horror wetlands that intrude like fingers right up into the deltas. It's a very, if you take a satellite view of this, this landscape, it's very interesting. It's this green sea with these dry brown fingers into them. And when you start traveling that on the Makoros and places like that, you, you realize it's stark, it's, a, it's a almost day and night uh, a relationship between these two. 
And how do they interact? What are the interdependencies of the wetlands with the forest areas and things like that? Those are the questions that start coming to, to mind. So in the face of this scientific poverty of data, uh, they, we've been using exploration to fill the gaps. And some of the background questions that, that come with a science uh, view of life are, what is the state? What is still there? We hear stories. We, we know that this was a war zone. We, we know that there'd been very little uh, apart from war carried out in that area for a long time. But what is the state? What is it left? It looks intact from the satellites, but what is it like on the ground? What are the habitats and the ecosystems, the microhabitats? What goes on down there? What is the human presence and what is the footprint? of humanity in that area? What is the infrastructure that they've developed? And what are their interactions, as you've already seen some of the images from Steve, taking place uh, on the ground? So our approach has always been, and it has to be, at this level of uh, ex expeditions, uh, getting in there. And the background to the, uh, the text shows you, in fact, the the details of, of the, the, where the expeditions have been. A network, a spider web of increasing, uh, in, increasing knowledge gathering uh, through these expeditions. It's a wonderful way to do it, and from a scientific perspective, very exciting. It's not really often that scientists get such exciting opportunities to gather data and so forth. So we had that marvelous uh, 2015 source to sink trip, uh, which I took part in part of it, uh, and then uh, th there was a land party associated with that that did uh, uh, explorations in the area. We did two in 2016 and another two uh, big ones in 2017 where we extended ourselves because the scientists were starting to gather data then and saying, but this is not what we know from the Okavango, it's not entirely the picture. And the entire picture needed to bring in a very different uh, hydrological system, the Kubango, and that's what happened uh, in the last year. Our focus areas have been, uh, again, around the obvious ones, plants, fungi, invertebrates, fishes, herbs, birds, small mammals, and large mammals, and the representatives of those groups are here and going to be telling us a little more of the details, so it's not my job right now. But you can see we've tried to cover the sort of things, including the iconic elements, that will allow that conservation argument to be presented to the public. It's so important that we've got these elephants and leopards and lions and sables. Oh, sorry, Brian, there are no sables in this area, I don't think. But, uh, we also looked at humanities, and here are some of my favourite pictures that I've taken there. Uh, Johnny talking to <laughs> uh, a village chieftain who dressed up for the occasion. This was such an important event. He stopped us when, he, when the convoy went through the village and he said, wait a minute, I've got to go and dress up for this interview. And he went out and came out and sat like that. And it was really, uh, it was just so in interesting to see. And his hat sat on his head, and he was so intense in this interview that he didn't notice his hat slipping down his face. I don't know if Johnny noticed it, but I was on the fringe taking this picture. And in the end, it was covering his eyes, but he'd carried on talking. It was just marvellous. And of course, there was a lot of head-butting going on in the village itself, and a lot of uh, disinterest from other members of the party, like brothers and things like that, around what sisters were doing. But it was a, it was a lovely event for me, because it did demonstrate very clearly that uh, this human element was so vital to our understanding and the future of, of whatever goes on there. So human impact and eco-threat, uh, again, Steve has given you a much more vivid uh, image of that, but here again is a, that fishing that Gertz took in there when they were going down there, just rows and rows and rows of these drying big fish out of a very poorly productive system. This was down towards the Namibian border areas where gill nets were in operation. And if this starts taking place 
uh, higher up in the system, above Quito Quanabar, I'll tell you now it won't last more than a year or two. There's just not the fish there to, to sustain it. So there's burning going on. There's hunting and fishing, bees and ring barking, bushmeat trade, logging and clearing, agriculture, infrastructure and urbanisation, and we need a handle on this. So our science started to say there were more things than just recording, just knowing what is there. We had to know what was the human uh, interactive elements, what were the important things to sustain uh, if, this, if this environment is going to be here for our children and our children's generations beyond that. We've employed modern technologies, and you've seen some of that better portrayed than I can ever do, but this, this is the, the trap lines that we've been setting, and Curlin is here. He woke up from his slumbers in the village and got going with trap lines, and we, we really, this is going to need to extend if we're going to get a real handle. It's very limited at the moment, and uh, when you look at that core area, the, it, it's the sort of thing that we need to get going, because those trap lines are living... Uh, monitoring of what is going on there when we are not there. Very important technologies. The, uh, our technologies have gone way beyond that and they've been employed on all sorts of scales. Um, we realise there's some gaps in it and I'll explain a little bit of that in a moment. But here is a, a couple of the images coming out of the river party that gets uh, managed to capture the information and you can see on the Cabango's transect there where their campsites were and uh, a whole lot of other elements that were being monitored real time as they went down the river. And uh, this one uh, here is very interesting because he kept trap lines and the thing I'll show you in the fish talk just now, uh, how even uh, a simple fishing can can inform us about differences in the, in the system. Not everything has been working, that's the way technology goes, and uh, Steve mentioned that we were doing on consistent uh, trying to get the environment over, a, over the every day, all day, real time. And we've had a lot of problems with this uh, to the point where we have not really got the data set that we would like out of it. And this has got to have uh, better attention, and I know that uh, there are plans uh, and, and, uh, to get this system uh, operating, or a system that works according to these principles. But this is an area that if we are going to get environmental issues uh, out of it, and environment to support observations that we're making, then uh, we need to have these sort of systems functioning. But in spite of all of that, uh, at the end of uh, two years or so, we of operating, our, our scientific footprint began to make real, real inroads into that, that wilderness that I'm going to be speaking of. And this is the image of data points coming out of the project at the end of uh, uh, 2016. And the, the Twitter feed said, we've covered a lot of ground in the last two years. 31,000 plant and animal observations and it gave this particular image. That's an incredible performance from any project anywhere uh, if you really sit back and think about it. Going into a wilderness where there's no support, no roads or anything like that, it's quite incredible. So at that point we took stock of the situation and realised that it was no good to just continue to record these things, we had to start uh, making inroads into understandings of particularly the hydrology, uh, the role of forest and wetland integrity. If, if the forest is going to be delogged or, or uh, open for agriculture, what impact is that going to have on the hydrology? Ecosystem function and services, what's going on there? And uh, the human demography and their system services. Uh, can it be sustainable and so forth? These are the questions that drove our extensions into the last year or so. Uh, hydrology, we engaged with Jackie in our audience here, and she has given us really, there's been a lot of hydrology done. To my surprise, I was unaware of this, but an enormous amount through OCACOM and, and its initiatives and through Jackie and her team over the last 10 years. And we 
I was largely ignorant of this particular thing. So it's really nice to, to have those insights coming out. And the hydrology, uh, we realized in our core study area was st still a gap. And this is what Jackie showed us, that that Quito Quinoval area was unknown hydrologically speaking. And we needed to get something going there. With the uh, problems we were having with some of the, the instrumentation and that, we realized we had to invest a little bit. And through Amy and teams, in there we got going with our own instruments and started putting some, some hydrological data into the set. But that's got to uh, obviously move. Peat cores, we've got a team here who's going to report later today on uh, the peat core. Uh, there was an initiative, and Gertz took a core in that lake. How old are these lakes? What, what has been their history? We know nothing, but if we're going to try to do something about it, we better know this when we start asking. So we've engaged with a team, and they're going to report later. Uh, Marion Bramford and Mariska are here with us today. The source lakes, uh, this year we undergo, for the first time, these mystical <coughs> lakes up there. We got into the water. And Ryan and, and the team there, uh, you saw some of those beautiful images uh, that came out of that. Uh, we started looking at that environment a little more closely. And then fire ecology. We realized that fire, and as, as Steve vividly showed, is, is an important part. It, it's up there. And, and what is happening there? So we've engaged with uh, South Africa's leading expert on fire ecology. And Brian's with us, and he's going to give us a little talk about it. He's going to tell you that very little is known about the fires in Angola, but uh, nonetheless, he's also got the insights to start telling us something about fire ecology. It's not all evil, and it's not all good either. And then we uh, got a Mapiri camp, and the Mapiri camp is uh, an important step forward. It's going from just expeditions to an opportunity where we can say to researchers and scientists, you don't have to do an exploration. You can base your research and you can do uh, studies in an area that takes a transect from permanent wetland to dry Kalahari Desert within five or six k. What a transect opportunity that is. And I had an opportunity together with uh, a couple of colleagues to have a look at that camp and I'll show you. Uh, exploring the source lakes, we're going to, as you saw, more vivid images and we, it just shows you the potentials. We put traps into those lakes for the first time. We picked up a species that is known, this little minnow here. Uh, oops, what have I done? Good, something. <laughs> oh, dear. There we go, back again. <laughs> um, for the first time in that area, in that entire area, uh, we put the trap in, and Rainer brought these fish out to me and said, well, two little animals in it, that's all we caught, Paul. I said, I don't believe it. And they were there, a species that occurs downstream in the mainstream, that's the first time and only time we found it up in that particular area. And then Mopiri Camp, here it is, uh, to just put you in some perspective, it's at the foot of the panhandle, just as the delta uh, starts expanding. And it, it, there's a transect for you, right from permanent lagoons to all sorts of marshes uh, to dry land, wetland interfaces, and the very dry land right there. And there's, so there's transects for all sorts of work. And some infrastructure has started, and uh, I, I visited it with, a, with an eye on, on what would uh, scientists require and so forth. And I put in a short report, and that's obviously something that we've got to give some attention to. There are very established research agencies in, the, in, the, um, in Botswana, and we've got to start looking at the similar things perhaps up there in, in the core study areas as well. Because certainly some of our science can't be in and out. It's got to be on a more sustained basis. So the momentum grows, and... Uh, and we are on a, a path that, that has been <coughs> tracked and we're following this leadership, this inspiring leadership in this particular project. It's doing stuff that almost no other scientific project that I'm aware of has ever tried to do. And that is span three countries, an entire basin. And when we start talking water conservation with the world that I come from, 
catchment basin is the absolute essential. You can't talk taking a section out of it and trying to do anything. You've got to talk the entire system. And that, this is a project that realistically and in t terms of, of, of doing that is the first that I've really encountered almost anywhere and it uh, really is an exciting road. Thank you very much.